Hi everybody, Dan here. Welcome to Drinking a Movie. Now on this channel, we'll be pairing cocktails and spirits to some of the greatest movies ever made. And the channel was inspired by a Facebook series I did when COVID broke out. If you recall, we were all stuck at home wondering what we could do with our extra time. Well, I made a lot of cocktails, watched a lot of movies, and then I saw where there were some synergies between the two and wrote a whole series about it. And it gravitated with a lot of people. So we decided, hey, let's make this a vlog so other people can enjoy this. So what we're gonna do here, and our intentions are, we'll talk about the cocktails, we'll prepare the cocktails, and you can play along at home, and then we'll give you our impressions on them. Maybe some history, uh, talk about some of the spirits you use, for instance. And we'll also look at movies, and um, see. How, we'll tell you how we think they, they combine, but at the same time, we'll get into the movies, some fun facts about it, go into the director, maybe some other impressions with the stars and the, and the crew. So uh, we really hope you enjoy it and you'll stay with us through this whole experience. But before we get going on tonight's picks, if you could kindly hit the subscribe button and the like button, it would go a long way to support our channel. Truly appreciate that. All right, so what are we talking about tonight? Well, we have what I would consider two absolute classics. First, a cocktail that's considered the holiest cocktail, uh, holiest of all cocktails, I should say, uh, this is dry martini, and we'll do it a classic way. Um, simple ingredients, simple process. Um, I'll show you how I do it and how I enjoy it, but it's one of those cocktails that really you do to taste. From a movie perspective, we're going to look at 1934's It Happened One Night. Such an influential uh, screwball comedy, rom-com. It paved the way for so many movies after it, and you'll see influences in, in similar movies even made today that reference some things that were done in that movie. So, tremendous, tremendous film. Um, Frank Capra directed it. It starred Clark Gable and Claudette Colbert, and they were both amazing in the role, uh, in their both of their roles. So, we'll get into that, but let's talk about the drink first. Okay, so we have our ingredients for the dry martini here. Um, and before we get into making, I want to give you a little bit of history around this, this cocktail, so it's, which is actually fairly confounding. So the martini really makes an appearance in the 1890s. Um, and what's interesting about that is it called for Old Tom Gin, which unlike this London Dry, is an aged gin, a little heavier in flavor, definitely heavier, heavier in the color. Uh, but over time, people began to want a more drier experience with their martinis. So the dry martini was invented and really became um, something known in the 1900s, early 1900s. And um, of course, it's, it was London-based, uh, London dry gin. Um, the vermouth stayed the same. But interestingly enough, that initial recipe called for orange bitters as well as a lemon twist in addition to an olive. Well, um, that over time evolved to what I consider the classic dry martini, which is simply um, dry gin, the, the uh, dry vermouth, and of course, the olive garnish, excuse me. So um, what you'll need for this drink um, are those ingredients, obviously. You want a shaker with ice and you want fresh ice. You do not want ice that's been sitting out and it's kind of diluted a little bit uh, because you don't want a, the, the initial cocktail to be watery in any kind of uh, sense. Um, if you want to go old school, you would get yourself a strainer. Now, most of the shakers do come with a cap and, and you could and a built-in strainer that you can use, not a problem. Um, a bartender's best friend, which of course is a bar spoon. Now, this um, is a key ingredient for anyone who doesn't want be want to be blasphemous because martinis, um, as any you know purist would tell you, need to be stirred. You do not shake a martini. Sorry, James Bond. Uh, so you want to have a spoon so you can do the stirring. And of course, the measured jigger. So this one is great because it goes from two ounces all the way down to a quarter ounce, which a lot of recipes call for quarter ounces of things. All right, so let's make our martini. Got our ice and our shaker ready to go. First ingredient you want to add is two ounces of the gin. Voila. Next up, you want to add the vermouth. Now, a lot of people 
Um, this is where the, the concept of taste comes in because a lot of different people want drier experiences. Some people will add um, more vermouth and then those who want that drier experience will add less and less and less and take it to the extreme where some people are saying, I don't want to add any, I just want to wave it over the, the shaker. That's all I need to do. We're not going to do that. We're going to add some vermouth. Um, to me, it's critical. I'm going to add a half ounce. It's modest, makes the martini still very dry, and at the same time, very, very tasty. So the two main ingredients in included. Now we add the spoon and do a stir. Now they say you want to stir this for about 90 seconds. I'm not going to do the entire 90 seconds as we're sitting here talking. But I want to give it a good stir. All right, once we have that stirred to perfection, we go ahead and get our martini glass. Now I kept my glass in the freezer because uh, you want to have it chilled. It's the best experience with it chilled. And then simply pour your beautiful looking drink into the glass. Perfect. And then I've already got my olives pre pre-stabbed, if you will. So take your olives, give it a nice stir, and voila, a dry martini, the way it should be. So, welcome to the movie chair. Got my dry martini, got my coaster, because I respect wood, and you should too. Before we get into the movie, I wanna give you my impressions of this drink. Oh yeah, that's nice. So what's great about a dry martini to me is it's dry. You're not getting too strong a savory flavor. You're not getting too strong um, a sweetness, but obviously there's no sweetness in this. And I think for me personally, the, the half ounce balance of vermouth with the two ounce of gin is perfect. Um, you're getting that, really that perfect balance for me. Now, some people might want to draw in a little more vermouth, take out some of the gin, um, some of the botanicals you get from the gin. Other people might want it even drier. It's all up to you. I also get a nice um, nice flavor with the olives in here. So it's perfectly balanced for my tastes. Um, if you're making one at home, hopefully you enjoy it as well. Mm. Oh yeah. So let's talk about the movie. So how successful was It Happened One Night? Well, it's the first film to accomplish a major feat in Hollywood. So it won the five major categories at the Oscars. It won for Best Movie, Best Director, Best Actor, Best Actress, and Best Screenplay. So you talk about those five elements, the core elements of a good, good film. This won it all. It swept. Um, fantastic achievement for certainly the whole cast and crew. So it's got that going for it, obviously. Now, Frank Capra, um, he would go on to make Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, which was a big hit with James Stewart. He would also make another James Stewart movie that probably everyone has seen or seen parts of, and it's called It's a Wonderful Life. Uh, interestingly enough, we'll get into a little bit more about Frank, uh, Frank Capra in a moment, but um, we talk about this movie, you're talking about a little bit of a departure from those in the sense that this one was more of a rom-com. You had two opposing characters who would end up falling in love, right? You had the uh, Claudette Colbert character. She was a real spoiled socialite. And then you had the Cary Grant, um, sorry, Clark Gable, not Cary Grant, the Clark Gable character who was, you know, the upcoming ambitious reporter who saw this opportunity um, in her running away. So you're talking about a socialite running away from her family and a reporter on her tail. Um, looking for that big, big uh, story that would be a Pulitzer Prize winning hit for him in his career. Um, interestingly enough, they both, both of those characters weren't, um, I'm sorry, both of those actors weren't picked for this role initially, but I don't know that you could have picked a better, a better pairing. So um, the movie itself, you're talking about um, the perfect balance of witty dialogue. You're talking about very much uh, clever scenarios and um, sight gags that would go on to influence movies for decades to follow. Uh, 
another thing about this film is it was considered pre-code, which means um, pre-code was a period from when silent movies ended and talking movies started uh, up until uh, 1934. So this is one of the last films that got in inside that pre-code. And pre-code means that the censorship was a little bit more lax. So there was a lot more sexual innuendo, a lot more um, controversial subject matter that would appear in films during this period, language, just kind of some of the actions. So uh, it's interesting to see this film as kind of the, one of the later, the later stages of that. Um, after that period, uh, when the code really went into effect in enforcement, you saw much more um, tame movies, you know, in terms of subject matter, a little bit more um, easier going, I suppose you could say. So a final note about Frank Capra. Um, obviously, he's a, legend, a legendary Hollywood director. Um, just such an important figure in the early, in the golden age of Hollywood, for sure. Uh, what's interesting about him is a lot of moviegoers and critics dub his work as Capricorn. And what they mean by that is a lot of his work seems very overly sentimental, very, um, that just taps into a high level of optimism, uh, more so than a lot of the other filmmakers of his day. But when, in retrospect, that makes a lot of sense because take this movie, for instance, uh, Happy One Night was filmed in 33 and released in 34. Um, and the fact that you're in the midst of the Great Depression at the time, people wanted something to, that, you know, was a little bit more hopeful, a little more of a light in the darkness that they were experiencing in every day. They didn't want to see some heavy, sad story. They wanted to really experience something that would be a little more uplifting. So Capra was a master at delivering that kind of a story, framing his actors, um, catering to the story elements, and he just delivered every time, and I don't think there's anyone better at that kind of sentiment slash um, optimistic viewpoint in film, especially at that period in time. So if you get a chance, I highly recommend watching this movie. I know it's 1934, it's black and white, it's very old, but let me tell you something, it's such a great movie, and you can see the influence it had on so many of the films that followed it. Um, I think Clark Gable at the top of his game, Claudette Colbert, screen legend that a lot of people, they've heard the name, but maybe not have seen, seen her work before. And then you're talking about a director who, again, talk about top, being at the top of their game, uh, Frank Capra, Capra is just fantastic. So if you get a chance, check it out. I hope you do. If you do, please leave a comment. Um, I'd like to hear your experiences, not only with, with the, the film, but with the, with the cocktail you made. Um, hopefully you, you gave this one a shot. A lot of people um, are off and on with, when it comes to gin, but um, hopefully you tried it. Hopefully you tried the movie. And um, thank you very much for, for coming. I hope you enjoyed it. Here's to you, cheers, and we'll see you in the next movie. Have a good night.